Hi, this is Dr. Mustafa Khan. I'm a board-certified orthopedic spine surgeon. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a condition called cervical radiculopathy. In particular, I will focus on four things. Number one, what is cervical radiculopathy? Number two, what causes this condition? Number three, how can it be diagnosed and identified? And number four, how can it be treated? So let's talk about it. So what is cervical radiculopathy? Well, simply put, it is a condition where because of either a pinched or irritated nerve in the neck, you can develop shooting pain, numbness, and tingling radiating all the way into the upper extremities. Sometimes the symptoms can be confined to the shoulder, to the arm, the forearm, or the hand. And sometimes you can have a combination of all of the above. So what causes cervical radiculopathy? Well, in order to answer this question, we will very quickly take a look at the anatomy of the cervical spine. The cervical spine consists of seven bones stacked on top of each other. These are called the vertebrae. Between the bones, you have a disc, which is basically, you can think of it like a soft cushion. Now, between the bones and the discs, if you come out to the outside of the spine, there is a small opening called the foramen. You can think of the foramen like a small exit ramp through which the nerve travels out of the spine. Now, there are eight cervical nerves or cervical nerve roots that come out of the neck. These are numbered C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. From a clinical standpoint, the most commonly affected nerves are the C6, the C7, and the C5. And we will talk about each one of these conditions in a little bit. Now, when you look at this anatomic model, you can see that the nerve is vulnerable to getting pinched at two locations. The first one is where the nerve is passing right next to the disc. If the disc pops out, if a small piece of it herniates, it can kink the nerve, compress the nerve. The second way that the same nerve can get compressed is if the tunnel through which it's passing, the foramen, becomes tight due to bone spurs or due to a degenerating disc which gradually calcified over a long period of time, the same nerve can become irritated and compressed, thereby causing cervical radiculopathy. So how is cervical radiculopathy diagnosed? Well, typically a patient will come into my office and complain of some element of neck pain with radiating symptoms into the upper extremity. Again, this can be pain, numbness, tingling, a sensation of pins and needles, sometimes even some weakness. A good way to test whether or not these symptoms are coming from the neck is by performing the Sperling's Maneuver. Sperling's Maneuver is a simple test which consists of the following moves. You turn your head towards the side that is painful, rotate it, and then you extend the neck. If by doing this, the neck, shoulder, arm pain, numbness, and tingling gets worse, that is a positive Sperling's test. That is because when you turn the head towards the affected side, the pinching of the nerve gets worse. The opposite of the Sperling's test is something called the Bacotti Maneuver. This basically is the following. If you have the patient take their hand, put it on top of their head, the pain will usually improve. The reason is because now you're taking the tension off the nerve root and thereby you're feeling better. A lot of times, simply based on the patient's description of where he or she is having the pain, you can get a pretty good idea of which one of these cervical nerve roots is involved and irritated without even getting an MRI. I'm going to talk to you about three of the most common nerves that are involved in most cases of cervical radiculopathy. So let's start by talking about the C5 nerve. The C5 nerve is the nerve that comes out of the neck between C4 and C5 vertebrae, and then predominantly goes into the deltoid. So most of these patients will have neck pain, pain radiating into the middle trapezius, along the shoulder blade, and then going into the deltoid. Again, they may have pins and needles, numbness and tingling in addition to the pain. They may also have some weakness of the deltoid, meaning they may have a difficult time raising their shoulder against resistance. The C5 radiculopathy is actually quite interesting. Sometimes I see patients who've undergone shoulder surgery because the shoulder MRI showed a rotator cuff there, but their shoulder pain continued. And it turns out when you get an MRI of the cervical spine, they have a pinched C5 nerve and they have a C5 radiculopathy. And typically those patients, when they have surgery of the cervical spine, that shoulder pain is relieved in excellent fashion. The C6 nerve, which comes out between the C5 and the C6 bones, is perhaps 
the most commonly affected nerve root in most cases of cervical radiculopathy. These patients will have neck pain that radiates into the middle trapezius, usually going into the biceps, and then continuing on into the radial, or this part of the forearm, and continuing on into the thumb and the index finger. They may have a weakness of elbow flexion against resistance, and their bicep reflex may be diminished. The pattern of radicular pain associated with a C7 nerve is a little bit different compared to C6. This nerve originates between the C6 and the C7 vertebrae. It comes out of the neck and then goes into the tricep, continues on into the radial aspect of the forearm, and then goes towards the middle finger. If you have a patient who has pain, numbness, or tingling referred into the middle finger, that is pretty much a classic C7 radiculopathy. Although today's topic is cervical radiculopathy, very quickly I want to mention a condition which I also see very frequently, which must not be confused with cervical radiculopathy. And what I'm talking about here is a cervical referral pain from the inflamed joints of the neck. So, as we have previously discussed, there are seven cervical vertebrae, and there are tiny joints between them. And if you have an inflammation of this joint, depending on which joint is inflamed, you can have a somewhat characteristic pain pattern. Now, the characteristic of a cervical referral pain from the inflammation of the joints is that they're localized close to the spine, and it does not radiate beyond the shoulders. When I see a patient whom I suspect of having cervical radiculopathy based on their history and their physical examination findings and I want to confirm my diagnosis, I will typically order an MRI. Sometimes, but not always, I may also order an EMG nerve conduction study. Interestingly, the EMG nerve conduction study can be helpful in differentiating whether or not somebody's shoulder pain is coming from the neck or from the shoulder itself. It is not unusual for patients to have shoulder pain either from the neck or from an intrinsic shoulder problem like a rotator cuff tear. The initial treatment of most cases of cervical radiculopathy is almost always conservative. Those patients are typically prescribed anti-inflammatory medications, maybe a short course of oral steroids, physical therapy, chiropractic treatment, and other treatments like cervical traction, which can actually be very helpful because it opens up the space between the cervical nerve roots. The vast majority of patients with cervical radiculopathy will actually do really well with conservative and non-operative care, but about 15 or 20 percent of patients will not improve. For those patients, there is the option of an elective cervical spine surgery. The most common type of surgery that we do for cervical radiculopathy is called anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. During this surgery, we remove the degenerated disc or the herniated disc, and using special tools, we open up the spaces between the bones, between the vertebrae, and decompress the cervical nerve. Because the degenerated or herniated disc has been removed, we take a small piece of bone graft and plug it into where the disc used to be and put a small plate to stabilize the cervical spine. Depending on how many nerves are pinched or how many discs are degenerated, we can perform a one-level ACDF, a two-level ACDF, or a three-level ACDF, where we remove one or two or three discs, respectively, and fuse the vertebral bodies. For the vast majority of cases, this surgery is extremely successful, and this surgery has a very long and successful track record. So in conclusion, the vast majority of patients with cervical radiculopathy will be treated very successfully with non-operative treatments. However, for a small percentage of patients who continue to have persistent symptoms, surgery can be an excellent option.